Deborah, just before the break, we were about to talk about methodology, how mm -hmm. you approach this book. Uh, tell us something about the travels you undertook to research for this book. Well, um, probably the, the biggest thing was that I actually moved my family to Amsterdam. Um, and we ended up staying there for four years. Um, so that was, that was probably the single biggest undertaking um, because Ayan Hirsi Ali was in the Netherlands when, um, when I first started working on the book in 2005. Um, and so I thought I would go there and be able to understand better the milieu that had produced her. Um, she, as you may know, ended up coming to the United States in 2006, but by that time I was already in Amsterdam, so I stayed there. Um, I also went to Africa, to Kenya, which is where she's from, and of course I visited Pakistan a number of times um, to research Afia. I also came to Boston because Afia lived in Boston for about 10 years, um, and um, so all in all it was a lot of traveling. Many years. Yes. Were you able to meet uh, these two, either of the two? No, I never was. Well, I never was able to interview them. Um, Ayan Hirsi Ali refused my request for an interview. Now, I did go to public events where she was speaking at, and sometimes I stood up and asked questions, but I never met her on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, and Afia Siddiqui, she was missing for most of the time that I was working on the book, and then after she was captured, she was being held in jail, and she wasn't allowed to see the media. But I did go to her trial, and I sat just a few rows behind her, and you know, was able to see her in action, as it were, in the tr in the courtroom. Um, and when you went to their societies uh, in Kenya, for example, you must have talked to many people from her ethnic background, the I Somali. Did, yeah. uh, what did you take from those interviews? Well, it was fascinating. Um, the neighborhood where she grew up, which is called Eastley in Nairobi, um, it was much as she described it in her book, An Infidel. Um, and I, 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 you know, I did have a, a funny encounter. Um, at one point, I wanted to, um, she mentions in one of her books that she used to attend these meetings of the Muslim Brotherhood um, at a Muslim community center, which was near the school where she, that she attended. So I went to this Muslim community center thinking I would try to see if there was anyone who knew her or who remembered her. Um, and so I was ushered into this, to the women's section of the community center and I had a copy of Ayan's book um, with me and it said infidel on the front of it. And so one of these young women said, oh, what's that book? Infidel, who's this? And they, they didn't remember her at all, but they were fascinated by the book. And she said, she said, she's going to be like Salman Rushdie if she's calling herself an infidel. She could get herself killed. And it was really just like someone out of the pages of her book was speaking. So, um, so you got a sense of yeah. what it's like yeah. on the ground. Yeah. Uh, did you get a sense of this tribal society that she's coming from? Well, a little bit, but this was in Kenya. And, you know, these are Somalis who have migrated to Kenya. The community that she grew up in was, in Somali terms, you know, sort of a, an upper class group of Somalis um, because this is, these are the people who left Somalia and then formed the basis of the rebel movement that eventually overthrew Siad Bari, the Somali dictator. Her father was a leading politician. So there were people who were coming out of a tribal society into an urban society and trying to make that adjustment. And that was the very difficult adjustment that her family went through while she was growing up in Kenya. Um, and Ayan has obviously been very successful, but her, both her brother and her sister kind of suffered tragic fates. Um, they were not able to make that jump between. So what happened to them? Well, her sister died, probably committed suicide. Um, she suffered from mental illness. Her brother has also, also suffered from mental illness, and he lives in, in Kenya, but he's never really been able to make, make anything of himself. Um, because she adores her father, mm -hmm. and yeah. he's one of the uh, charismatic leaders of the Darud right. clan of the, of the Somali. Right. Um, and, and again, uh, are, the, are these cases reflecting the larger tragedy of these peoples who are constantly being moved around and facing yes. all kinds of challenges? Yes, very much so, very much so. And, and Ayan talks about that in her books, you know, how her mother, for example, was illiterate. Um, 
and came to Kenya and she wanted her children to get an education. Um, but she didn't really know how to help them to get that education because she herself hadn't gone to school. So uh, all the children were, were brilliant. They were very, very intelligent. Um, but she had a hard time keeping them focused into going to school. And in fact, Ayan's sister and brother never did actually graduate. Um, so. Um, and and Ayan, of course, is being driven by the sense of learning, growing in one sense, yeah. um, like Afia is, Afia goes to MIT, gets a PhD, yeah. etc. And that again is at the base of uh, Islamic learning, as you know, that right. the, the urge to learn, it's, it's very much at right. the core of Islam. Uh, and I would say it's uh, a feature that's lost to many Muslims, mm. they don't even recognize this. Uh, what about uh, Afia? Uh, Deborah, you talked about Pakistan and the debates going on uh, within uh, Pakistan society. Were you able to talk to any members of a family in, in Karachi? Not really. Um, I did have some email contact with different members of her family, and I was very much in touch with her lawyers. Um, so, you know, I was able to get that side of the story from them. Um, but her family did not cooperate with me. Um, I did. Um, I did have contact with her former in-laws um, from her first marriage and her first husband. Um, so, I, so I did get to know them a little bit and learn from them something about what Afia had been like before she disappeared. Um, I also got to know some people in Boston who had known her as a student um, and as a young scientist and mother. Um, and what was their impression? Was there any hint that one day she'd turn out like she did turn out? Well, in a way, because she had been, she was well known in Boston as a student, as a fundraiser for jihad. Um, she, she started out during the Bosnian Civil War and she was raising money for the Bosnian Mujahideen, um, fighting to defend the Bosnian Muslims. And then she, um, as, she, as time went on, she began to see the United States as the, the enemy of Muslims. So um, people who knew her well, or people who knew her in Boston knew that about her. Um, so it wasn't perhaps that surprising. Now Boston is of course not dangerous for a journalist like you writing a no. book on Afia, mm -hmm. but Karachi would have been. Uh, what were your feelings after all? This is the city where they committed that uh, terrible, that uh, shocking murder of uh, Danny Pearl. Uh, what were your feelings as an American journalist, uh, female journalist in Karachi pursuing this, uh, this story? Well, I talk about that in the book a bit. Um, you know, particularly when I first went to Pakistan for this, to write about Afia, um, I, I knew that she was accused of having worked for Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who of course had also been the one to kill Danny Pearl. Um, I had known Danny Pearl very slightly in Atlanta um, when he, he and I were both reporters there. Um, so I found it frightening to think that I was delving into the world of someone associated with, with that, his murderer. Um, and I, I approached um, a man called Khalid Hawaja, um, who was known as a, as a conduit um, between jihadis and journalists, um, and who had who Daniel Pearl had also approached when he was trying to get in touch with um, Sheikh Gilani, which ultimately led to his murder. I approached Khalid Awaja and asked him for any information about Afia, and he tried very hard to talk me out of of pursuing the story. And he said, um, you know, you should should bear in mind what happened to Daniel Pearl. So that so did He was, in a sense, um, almost implicitly threatening you. Yeah. I, I, I couldn't, at the time, I couldn't decide whether he really was threatening mm. me or whether I was being paranoid about mm. it. Um, so I just went ahead with the story. But then later, I went back to see Hala Dawaja years later, after Afia had been captured, and he sort of laughed and he said, you know, I actually was trying to steer you away from that story. I was trying to get you off of that. Um, because he said, at that time, I thought she was hiding. Um, she might be hiding, and I thought it would be better if you just left her alone. But of course, now I know that she was in a secret prison because he was part of part of the people arguing that that was the case. Um, and so, um, so anyway, but he admitted that he had been trying to steer me away from it. Uh, Deborah, give us a sense of the dangers on the ground for a young journalist in case some of our viewers are planning to go into your profession, journalism, out there in the Muslim world. You're in Karachi, 
a city of something like what 16 17 18 million yeah. people it's law and order problems uh, people are being picked up for um, and kidnapped uh, hostage